we might uh, get underway. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai haere mai, and welcome to the latest in our uh, series of Balance is Better webinars. Uh, this one's focused on school sport. My name's Roger Wood. Uh, I'll be your host tonight. I'm the Ranga Tahi lead for Sport New Zealand, and uh, my role is working mainly in the secondary school space and uh, working both within Sport New Zealand and uh, our partners uh, to advise them on the importance of physical activity for rangatahi. I'd um, like to start with the Sport New Zealand karakia um, that will uh, just bring us together and, and settle us into the kaupapa for tonight. So, tu tau mai runga, tu tau mai raro, tu tau mai roto, tu tau mai waho. Kia tau ai te mari tu, kia tau ai te mari ora, tu tu te whakamaua, kia tina, tina. Homie, who are you? Yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight, and uh, welcome to uh, our New Zealand audience and anyone dialing in from overseas. We've got about 130 people online, um, which is really impressive. Obviously, a, a popular topic. Um, to help us uh, as we go through the night, it'd be and to help you as well, find out where the chat function is. It'd be really good if you could uh, drop your your name if you want to. Just first name's fine. Um, uh, where you're from and and whether you're from a sport or recreation organization or whether you're from a school so the chat function is uh, on the right hand side of your screen you should be able to find that um, as i said we've got about uh, 130 odd people online which is uh, awesome if you've got any questions at any time now now that you're figuring out where the chat function is just drop them in we'll answer those questions either as we go or we'll have a bit of a session at the end and see if we can make sure that we're covering everything all your questions that you've got and uh, if you have some technical issues, then the advice from our uh, technical gurus behind the scenes is uh, just close your browser and then go back to the link and, uh, and re-log in. Um, so let's uh, let's get on into it and, and introduce our guests. We're really lucky to have uh, two experts in the school sport and school system. Uh, Gregor Fountain uh, is Sport New Zealand's Strategic Engagement Manager. He supports Sport New Zealand and our partners with uh, uh, effective engagement with the education sector. Gregor was a teacher and school leader for 25 years. Um, uh, before joining Sport New Zealand, we're really lucky to have him. And he was principal of two schools, uh, Paraparaumu College and Wellington College. And Mike Summer was the chief executive of School Sport New Zealand. And Mike also has a teaching background, uh, was a health and PE teacher. Um, and before he moved into the sports system, Mike was the regional sports director at uh, Taranaki and has had the top job at uh, School Sport New Zealand for a couple of years. So welcome to both of you and uh, thanks so much for sharing your expertise with our audience. Uh, we might, uh, we all we all have memories, I guess, of our time at, uh, at school. Some of them are fonder than others, um, but typically uh, those memories often centre around uh, the extracurricular um, activities and the friendships that we make, and often they are about sport. Um, but as many of you know, and the reason you're probably joining this webinar is that interface between the sports system and the school system isn't isn't that easy. Uh, Gregor, as a school leader, I'd be really interested in uh, in hearing from you about the reality of the education system, and uh, and what the what the role of schools are in supporting sport. Uh, well, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, nā mihi nui kia koutou. Um, great to be um, on this call and thanks so much to everyone uh, for, for joining us uh, this evening and thanks for this opportunity. Roger, you know, I haven't been a principal for almost two years now, so um, it's been uh, great to be back and thinking about um, this particular topic. And, and as I did, I just, you know, realised just how hard it is to imagine secondary schools without sport, you know, it's such a powerful tool for creating belonging uh, for students. It's also um, such a key aspect of their own well-being. Uh, you know, when sport is positive and inclusive, it's certainly such a positive experience for young people within a school. Um, but also, you know, we know that um, young people that are engaged with physical activity, with play and active recreation and sport, have better education outcomes. It's not sport or academic study. It's all of, of those of all of those things together, and and that's what you know makes it a real, a really you know incredibly positive thing for our young people, um, you know within schools. And I think 
when I look back on um, teachers who are involved with sport in the time that I led schools, you know, I think we saw some of the most powerful educational relationships that existed between staff and students when they were involved in sport or when they were doing active recreation activities together. It created side on, side on opportunities to engage with young people and to get to know young people in a different way outside of the classroom, which you know, such a positive for for schools. Um, sport enables young people to be leaders, um, both within the teams that they're part of or on the tramps that they're on or whatever they are involved in, but it's also an amazing way of young people giving back to their schools. Um, and then just finally, you know, thinking about the real positives and, and the reason that these things are so, so uh, important in schools is that sport, you know, brings parents and whānau into school like anything else. You know, at a time when young people, adolescents are pushing parents away and wanting their own independence, for some reason, sport doesn't seem to be like that. You know, they want their parents to come and watch them. Uh, and I remember when I was first a principal at Paraparuma College working out that the Kapiti Netball Centre was a really key person to an, a really key area location for engaging parents and meeting families in a really positive um, environment. So, you know, sport um, contributes so much to uh, schooling and education and, um, you know, that's why principals really value it. Awesome. Thanks, Gregor. The uh, the school system, though, isn't really, uh, isn't always set up for sport, is it? There are some imperatives in, uh, in the education system that might drive uh, some decisions to, to not support sport. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, sport doesn't always bring the best out in people. We've seen that in other webinars in this series. Um, and, you know, this issue can add to the pressure which school principals and, and schools are under. You know, New Zealand schools are really complex places. Um, unlike lots of other countries, you know, every school in New Zealand is a separate crown entity. It's uh, each school has its own board of trustees and its own its own. Uh, and while this creates lots of opportunities to create a, a local curriculum in the school, it also puts a lot of pressure on teachers and, and principals. You know, school leaders don't just have to implement the education uh, imperatives, the curriculum and assessment uh, policies um, of of the government, they also have to be good employers and they need to observe health and safety legislation. So, you know, all these things do put um, schools under pressure. So sport can you know, sometimes get lost in the sort of busyness of, of the school day and in the crisis management that principals are doing. And it can also be a drain on resources. So, you know, sometimes it might be hard for schools to justify uh, putting the the resource into property um, or that sport requires or some of the financial issues or the human resources which which um, are required to run sport in schools. So, you know, in some schools it can be seen as a disconnected element to the school, um, which is a shame because as we've already discussed, there's so many positives, um, you know, in the schooling uh, to, in the schooling system when positive and inclusive sports at the forefront of what they do. Do schools have to run sport, Gregor? No. Well, you know, there's no specific, uh, there's no specific requirement. Used to be in some old educational guidelines that, that you know, that sport or was offered. Um, it's not actually a, a, a requirement, but it'd be so hard to imagine schools without sport. As I said, Roger, you know, our, our, it adds so much and makes schooling more than just a academic experience it creates community um, and and that's why it's such a powerful thing and while most schools you know attempt to be in that space hmm. I've, I've had a background in uh, in national sports organizations and certainly it was a bit of a surprise to me to find out that uh, that sport wasn't a requirement of the curriculum or of the education system at all and that in fact we were uh, fortunate in some ways to have our sport inside a school. That was a decision that was being made by the school rather than by the system. Yeah, and Roger, there's often confusion about what physical education is and what it isn't. So sometimes we think of physical education within the curriculum being an avenue for sport, and that's part of it. But 
uh, you know, uh, physical education is a, a standalone physical literacy uh, curriculum area, which has got a problem solving element at the heart of it and, and, uh, and is not simply about delivering sport. So that's often something that is misunderstood um, and can, uh, can uh, cause conflict when uh, physical educators don't want to just be seen as an avenue for sports delivery or a club coming in and running something. You know, they've got a curriculum, um, you know, which is really well researched that they need to deliver. Um, so that's a, you know, so, so that is a, a, you know, a misunderstanding that can cause problems. Hmm. Awesome. Um, Mike, let's go to you. Um, you said at the top of the the sport aspirations of schools and our students um, and often parents. Um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the school sports system and, and how that operates. Yeah, kia ora Roger, kia ora everybody. Um, yeah, look, in terms of where, where sport fits into that school landscape, it's, it's undeniably incredibly important. You're not going to find many prospectus or websites out there that don't have a picture of somebody playing sport in, in their school's jersey. And in that, you can you can be very sure that it means a lot for the school to be um, promoting and resourcing sport to the way that they do. Um, at, at a at a competitive level, it's it's an opportunity to create pride and a sense of belonging and build on the mana of previous teams and and really cr create that sense of what it means to be part of something. That's that's something that's hard to find inside of curriculum areas in a school. And at, at that social level, as as uh, Gregor said, you've got the connections and the friendships and just that, that genuine opportunity to get outside of the classroom. And that means a hell of a lot to the students and, and the teachers even that are inside those, those classes. But the reality is sport, as you've rightly said, is not the core focus of education and it's not the core focus of schools. And in fact, somebody who's had far more experience in this space than I, likens a principal's time if it's if it's this big sport is about this much of their day and the particular sport that you might be wanting to have a discussion is the tissue paper that rubs up on the far end of that and while it is a hugely important thing in the in the context of of the school landscape it is it is really difficult to carve out that time that i think everyone who really understands the importance of sport really thinks it probably should take up inside of a school um, the the system itself is is incredibly complex i think we'd all love it to be uh, really simple but the, but the reality is it not and um as as you've put up on that slide there the various layers the the players within it they're all looking for um time and energy and resource and space to deliver on what they think and probably are really amazing sport outcomes but navigating your way through that system can be incredibly difficult and um, you know, I think it probably speaks to the thrust of why we're here and, and want, wanting to look for some solutions today. But um, multiple times that that's 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 conflicting. You know, I, I think you, if you're inside a, a school, you'll find that um, it's not one sport coming to have a chat with you. It's multiple, and they all want to come in at the same time, and they're all wanting to peddle similar outcomes, and, and that's really difficult because usually that lands in a sports coordinator's lap. And sports coordinators, as I'm sure you've all heard before, um, they, they do not have much time. They're, they're incredibly time poor. Uh, a lot of the, the whole system revolves around them giving up probably more time than they've got to give and, and trying to make sport happen. But um, that's that's the, really the reality of the, of the school landscape as far as where sport fits in. But it is undeniably important inside of a school. Hmm. The, uh, the involvement of School Sport New Zealand, Mike, um, you've got the national calendar of events. There's a, there's a lot of those, and uh, they are probably the, the shop front. Um, but there's quite often a, a bit of negativity that goes with those, isn't there, and some profile? Yeah, I think increasingly we can lose sight of, of why sport fits inside of, of education you know it's that's not sport for the purposes of sport and and necessarily winning a a, um, a, a trophy uh, that's a that's a beautiful outcome and there's and look let's be honest there's a lot of students out there that 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 is their aspiration but it's not the the sole purpose for uh, why sport needs to be delivered and you know ensuring that uh, you are targeting the right students with the offering it is really at the heart of, of stopping a lot of that conflict. 
But yes, um, when you look at the calendar of 260 events, um, I think you would find that 99% of it is absolutely beautiful and works lovely, but that 1% seems to get far more airtime. Hmm. Certainly draws the uh, the media, doesn't it? Uh, national calendar. But <laughs> I guess what, uh, you know, and, uh, and when we think of, think of uh, sport for uh, for most young people, then it's it's played inside schools. It's an intra-school trust school um, opportunity and it's played regionally so the interschool school competitions that uh, that happen in every every region there's thousands of those events and uh, really significant impact on young people and an easier opportunity to engage in some ways not everyone's going to um, make it to the top rung are they oh correct and um, it, it, like, like I said it's hugely important that those opportunities mm -hmm. exist because you know, the context of delivering sport inside a school is to meet the, the needs of education and that, and that front end of the New Zealand curriculum where you're talking about key competencies and values. Um, you know, that's really the, what, what sits behind uh, interest school sport. Yeah, we might have a look at that, actually. I'm going to, we'll come back to that. Let's, um, Gregor, does that, anything that uh, Mike um, has, uh, has mentioned uh, resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, uh, the 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 behaviour of adults and players and spectators and sport, you know, can be a distraction from that, you know, amazing goodness that it brings. And and really, really important to understand that, you know, our young people want to be physically active. You know, they tell us that um, they want to be more physically active um, than they are. Um, but they don't always want to do it in the way that I want them to do it, um, which has, you know, often been in sort of competitive team sports. They have such a desire to play sport in a in a low key way with their friends, um, and that's one thing we've got to be really conscious of when we're thinking about engaging with young people. Yep, there are some that absolutely want to be in the first eleven and the first fifteen and the senior A netball team, and that's their goal. But there's others who who really just want to make that connection and have that joy of playing sport with friends or doing active recreation with friends and and sometimes there can be a a disconnect between what we as adults uh, think they should be doing and and the reality of how they might feel like they want to actually uh, be involved um, and that's a big challenge you know we're really good in primary school sport at developing age and stage approaches for sport. Um, so I think about, you know, my twins who play football and rugby and cricket and athletics and various other things. The rules and the formats have always been modified for their age. We're not so good at doing that with adolescents. We say, you know, commit for a whole season or get up at eight o'clock in the morning, which is, you know, very counter-cultural. Um, we seem to want to sometimes sort of provide a almost a high performance type environment which will never cater for the vast majority of kids. And I think that's a really, really important thing to understand the needs of the young people that we're working with and trying to serve. That transition from intermediate school to secondary school is, is really significant, isn't it? But, um, our observations are, even though participation grows, goes up initially, um, participation in, in sport and school sport particularly really drops at year 11. Um, but there's a shift, isn't there, from high parental engagement, customised uh, activity offerings, multiple sports opportunities and intermediate. Three months later, mm -hmm. uh, young people generally enter a, a pretty highly competitive and structured sports system. Yeah, and they have those other challenges, don't they, Roger and Mike, of, of you know, adolescence, um, which is, you know, really kicking in. So there are challenges around a body image. There are challenges around um, other pressures, um, high stakes examinations, um, the uh, the perceptions or the, the realities of needing to have after school employment, um, which means that we can't always expect young people to be available on a Saturday morning or a Saturday afternoon or even be able to stay after school for a practice or a training. So those those challenges are sort of additional things yeah, and 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 yeah, perhaps uh, you know one of the other challenges that we have is is trying to create a workforce that can support young people in their sport. So you know, adolescents can be tricky. You know, they um, 
they make short term decisions. Um, they can let people down. And so it is difficult. It's more challenging to work with um, adolescents uh, sometimes than maybe it is for primary school age kids. And uh, one of the challenges I think, you know, I noticed when I was a principal was that many of these awesome parents that had worked, gone through the primary school sports system, when they got to uh, secondary school, those parents felt like they'd done their bit or they felt that the school would take it over and would now be well placed to support those uh, those sports. Um, and so it was almost the worst of both worlds um, that you volunteers sort of were felt like they'd done their bit at that stage and yet we weren't equipped in the school to necessarily support um, the codes in the way that they'd expected. Mm. I think picking up on that, Gregor, what, what I've seen is the, the school gates can be a, a fantastic way of keeping kids inside the school for all of the great things that will happen inside there, but they're also just as good a barrier for letting people inside them. And I think there'll be a lot of people on, on this um, hooey that have some great ideas, but say they just can't get through those gates to, to get that support. And I think, um, you know, that, that kind of metaphor of we want to help, but we can't, or, or also the school's got it. You know, that's that's something that school sport is really battling with now because we know how difficult it is to attract teachers. We know that teachers are not engaging in sport that the way they used to for, for a whole host of reasons. And um, schools are crying out for support. But in a lot of cases, they're not very good at actually <laughs> articulating that back out to their communities. And I think uh, bridging that gap is, is hugely important if we want sport to maintain its importance inside a school. Sometimes that importance is a little bit out of whack, isn't it? So how do we how do we balance the, um, achievement um, in school and the school system and growing as a person with uh, some of the overemphasis on elite sport that uh, we are seeing in schools? Yeah, big question, Roger. <laughs> Solve that. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, I think it's it's finding that balance and uh, to the aspirational component that some students have to to compete at the highest level and and taking their skills out across the country and and what that means as as outcomes versus, I guess, that challenge of. Uh, teachers who understand the curriculum and, and the values and the vision behind it and having that that emphasis on on what that looks like from a coaching perspective and that being replaced by really well meaning community uh, coaches that may be looking at, at as a stepping stone and then schools resourcing them and potentially some of the outcomes that sit with with uh, that employment type of arrangement that they have and the behaviors that, that drives now but that that would be the tip of the iceberg, really. And, you know, as you said, the media are pretty good at picking that up and we're pretty good at um, highlighting some of the challenges. Uh, I think what sits under that is is a need to um, resource that school sports space better and allow you know, parents back in, students to actually uh, coach teams and, and have it run in the way that they want to see it run rather than implementing a system that tells them it needs to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. You got any thoughts on that, Gregor? Well, just that we've all got a role to play, I think, in speaking to that much wider value proposition that sport offers um, education and just well-being in general. You know, it's power to bring people together, um, the way that it um, enables young people to to make connections with people outside of their classes and sometimes from different year groups and the way that it brings parents together um, is such a powerful such a powerful thing um, and so I think uh, we all have a role to speak to that value and you know schools to a certain extent reflect their communities you know it's a competitive schooling system so how do we create and demand from our schools that 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 sort of right sort of positive sport is is what we want um, so yeah I think we've all got roles to play in in the system to speak to that really you know, really strong value proposition that inclusive and positive physical activity has for our young people. Hmm. The reality though is that uh, these are the years that young people are developing, talents developing, they're going to be targeted. Uh, and the real challenge here, I think, leads to a, bro a broader conversation around uh, collaboration between the sports system and the education and school system. Hmm. And that uh, that the schools, the schools bring facilities and organisers and young people but equally, the club system and the uh, the regional sport and recreation systems bring their own 
uh, resource in the in the in the frame of coaches um, and uh, pathways. So, if if you're a sport organisation sitting uh, listening to this webinar, I'd imagine that the uh, that one of the questions they're going to have is how do we marry those two together so that uh, the club system and the sport system have some sort of uh, synergistic working a relationship. Mm. Well, well, I it's think a bit you know, of an arm wrestle sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. That's and right. And tools. I think, you know, my observation, Roger, would be that um, neither schools nor clubs at some times have been good at putting the kids at the centre of those decisions. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, yeah, we, we find ourselves competing for, um, you know, these kids and, and, and for shaping those experiences and blaming each other for, for the dropout or for what's happening. Um, so I think that um, putting the young people right at the centre of this decision, listening to their needs and both being flexible around um, that offering and, and, and accommodating each other is, is really important. It's really hard, you know, we're set up to um, get funding for um, the number of kids that we've got involved and, and there is, uh, you know, status and things that come from these things. But you know, we, we see this working well. We see the young people being at the heart of those decisions that are being made. Mm. Yeah, look, the, the, the conflict seems to always come out at the at the pointy end of school sport, doesn't it? Where we're 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 fighting for the for the talent in inverted commas for across sports or or even across uh, club spaces versus school spaces versus academy and uh, everyone wanting to hold on to that talent. And that's, probably as you said, Roger, it's just a reframing of, of what's important, that talent will naturally rise. And really these years should be primarily focused for the majority on some really quality experiences and the memories that that's gonna give you. Hmm. Hmm. I'm just interested, um, Gregor, in your comment around putting young people at the centre. And uh, a lot of the advice we provide to schools and to sports organisations um, is about that, is about recognising that particularly during these years, a year, a year nine student, for example, is a different animal than a year 13 student. Mm. And uh, the challenge, I think, for the sports system is to customise the offering, uh, take away the, the uh, performance pathway and the, the talented young people, but to customise the offering for a year nine, 10, it's got to look different from a, from a year 13 or tw mm. a year 12, 13, because their lives are different. So, mm. uh, and that is challenging for the administrators of sport um, to have five or six different offerings. And some sports are really quite good at that. Um, but uh, when we see, that, uh, we're, we're quite strong on our advice that, uh, that if you expect a competition format to be relevant for a year nine student and it's still the same competition format and structure and length at year 13, then you, that's why one of the reasons you're going to lose young people. Um, and that's yeah. challenging for the sports system, isn't it? Yeah, and it might not always be in the way that you think because it's not necessarily, you know, sometimes our year 12 and 13s are the ones that are most after, um, you know, flexible social opportunities. So it's not always just a, a sent up to more competitive traditional structures either, Roger. Mm. Mm. I think we're, we're really good at um, just having the catch-all school sport and you know that as you said that that difference between how a year nine year 10 needs to play within it versus a, a year 13 is is absolutely huge and when you we did some um some research in and around students uh, feedback around school sport and, and bar none whether they felt they were on a competitive pathway or whether they were just uh playing soccer at lunchtime it, it was about fun it was absolutely about fun and it was about equity. You know, those we, we've we've kind of talked about the, the competitive system and, and the drive potentially in certain schools for uh, outcomes around trophies that the students are saying, well, they they want their friends to experience what they're experiencing, because if they do that, they'll just participate in sport forever. But the mm. system is kind of set up for, for that drive through for, for just them. And understanding how you can influence that at the different stages within a school is, is really important. It would be a huge step if we could really differentiate, differentiate the types of opportunities that we're providing at, at that kind of regional intra-school level. So how does a, 
a sport approach a school to have that conversation with young people about what their needs are. Yeah, well, I think, you know, often clubs and organisations do have connections with young people um, themselves. Um, and I, I do think that it's really important to be deliberate about designing engagements in ways that that you know can focus on some of the least active people if you go to a school with a um, offering that is actually going to really support the engagement of of um, young people and the, some of the least active young people or maybe some of the people that are least engaged with the schooling system and you can genuinely design a a sporting opportunity for these young people that's going to help meet their educational needs. It's very hard for it to hear, think of a school turning that down. So I think if you are able to go in with a how can we help uh, attitude, then that would be a really, really great in um, in terms of schools. So, mm -hmm. so many of our so many of our, our sports codes and and uh, active recreation providers do amazing work in youth development. Um, so I would have thought, you know, going to the school and saying, look, you know, what are the challenges that you have? How can we support and shape up what we're offering would be a really great way um, to think about um, that question. And, you know, it might be once you listen to the young people that you shape things quite differently than you might have, um, that you, than you might have um, traditionally thought of. Um, we went to the Youth Parliament um, Select Committee last year to hear the young people talking about um, uh, health, um, the, the health inquiry that they were leading. And their, their number one recommendation was that inclusive and student-led physical activity be made a priority within the curriculum timetables of all secondary schools, which is a really beautiful and amazing statement. But what these young people were saying is that, you know, we need this to be prioritised within the school day. We don't have the flexibility to do it in different ways. So listening to those young pe people really challenged some of my thinking around around what physical activity, what sport could look like in schools. You know, for these people, do we need shorter sort of uh, seasons? You know, do we need shorter opportunities to do different things? Should we be thinking about lunchtime engagements? Should we be trying to mobilise some of those late starts that sometimes secondary schools have? You know, are there windows in the school day that that we could that we could get in there and 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 work with the young people? So I think going with a, a sort of a, a problem solving element, a solution focus, being familiar with the things that are in the strategic plans of schools, what's in their sports plan, what's in the board minutes that I could speak to and and offer something you know in partnership with the school i feel like that would be a really great way to start hmm. that relationship yeah. building is quite important mark isn't it uh, sorry roger that relationship building with with schools by sports organizations is, is uh, really important yeah a absolutely huge i don't think there's any walk of life where you don't need to build a relationship before you're going to reach the outcome that you need and that's very true about schools they're they're complex places there's hierarchical structure around where decisions need to get made versus some things just happen and i think there's a natural tendency to either go straight to a sports coordinator or go straight to the top in terms of speaking to a principal and in some cases you know that's going to work for you and every school is going to be different but um, i think you need to be extremely flexible with your approach uh, if you are trying to target a, a particular school with an offering because you you need to do your homework as kind of Gregor is, is outlined there around um, the, the sport, the school's strategic plan, uh, the focus of the school at any particular time. And, you know, who, who potentially are the levers to achieve what you're looking to do? That might be uh, a PE teacher or any teacher, really, that has an interest in a certain sport. Uh, there might be a parent. Uh, that can influence somebody inside the school because um, even when you get in, you need to be flexible because things will change at the drop of a hat inside of a school. Um, uh, uh, Gregor's far better place to talk to that type of, type of conversation, but flexibility in your approach and not having a, a predetermined plan and I'm going to come in, I'm going to deliver this, it's going to take 30 minutes. It's, it just simply doesn't work inside a school. And the reality uh, for for uh, schools is that they can't offer all the sports or physical activities that young people want either. So uh, interesting question in the chat around 
know what's the um what's the approach that that a sport that's not represented in a school on a school menu of um of options uh how should they be um approaching schools to get their new sport in, included um and obviously you're probably going to go to the offer the solution um which doesn't have to be in the school i know that school sport new zealand has I don't know, a menu of 85 odd different sports, but um, but no school can offer all of those. So it's always going to be the reality that some things can't be offered, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think you just need to start with a bit of a coalition of the willing. Um, if you want to start a sport inside a school, there's usually a student who, who wants to play it. And that student is going to need to lean on friends and, and get people interested to actually drive a little bit of uh, excitement and opportunity around why that needs to exist in there. Because as you said, the reality is it, you just can't do everything. Um, and it's, it's got, there's got to be a, a value proposition inside that school that's built by the students, most likely for that to appear um, as an opportunity. But I think as as the shifts in, in the way that young people are, are looking to participate in sport, it is opening up the doors to, to you know, less formal, less traditional sports, getting a much more of a, of a, of a footing inside of schools. And um, you know, there is a drive for, for young people to play one-off opportunities to to have less formal, less competitive uh, structures. And I think it's those new sports that are really driving that opportunity. So kind of um, coming off the back of that is is a, is a, a really good opportunity for a new sport, I think. Yeah, I think one of the things we find with young people is that uh, they play a lot of sports, different codes when they're younger. Um, and as they get older, then they reduce the number of sports that they are involved in and sometimes down to zero. There's an opportunity for new codes that young people uh, normally aren't exposed to um, to actually uh, present a, a, a have a go option or a festival opportunity where young people can try it out. Because one of the things that's uh, difficult for young people in this age group is for them to engage in a sport or start a new engagement in a sport that other people have been playing for a long time. They don't have the confidence, they don't know the rules, don't have the social networks established. But the opportunity for a new sport that's uh, that no one's played before or a customised version of a, an existing sport that few people have played before is pretty high. And uh, that's it's that novelty that tends to engage young people. It's not a bad idea um, once you've built the relationship with the school, figure out who you need to talk to, to make that offer that you, you'll, you'll uh, uh, almost adopt a lost leader approach to it, go in and actually provide the opportunity for young people to try something they haven't tried before. Um, uh, rather than relying on uh, the existing menu. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. And I do think that particularly year nine is an opportunity where kids are trying new things. Um, I, th I think of my own son who hasn't really been in an organised sport. I've got a boy who's in year nine and he's suddenly, you know, with some friends picked up Friday night futsal through the college sport Wellington competition. Um, very social, very, very um, low key group of kids. But it's year nine, so you try a few new things. Um, and so, you know, that is a really great opportunity, isn't it, to get things on, on radar and create some new habits. Hmm. I, I don't think you can overstate the importance of the regional sports directors network and the school sport offices around the country in this type of conversation either, Roger. Um, you know, they, they we, I use that analogy of the gates. Well, I'd say they're probably the gatekeepers in a lot of the a lot of the schools around the country because they're really connected to what's happening um, inside those schools. And if if you if as a sport provider you're engaging uh, at a regional level with those RSDs around here's an outcome I want to achieve. How can how can I tailor this to suit a certain school? They'll actually know the school to go to. And um, you know, being flexible in your approach that it may not be a multi-school. 10 week program it might be you've got to get in and you've got to do some things but i think really establishing those relationships with the regional sports directors um is a is a real positive opportunity that, that could, you could a sport could really look at yeah it's a good point mike and uh and that slide that you showed before of the structure you know, the regional sports directors most of them sit in uh in college sport organizations or in regional sports trusts they are the connect, if you like, um, to all of the schools in their region, and uh, they know the demands and the constraints that schools are facing. So, a really, uh, a really positive um, option for anyone interested in not just uh, new sports into schools, but how they engage effectively with schools with their existing offering is 
that's a, a really important start point. Um, I'm sure the regional sports directors around the country will uh, wish I hadn't said that, but um, but it's true. <laughs> um, let's just um, let's uh, move to uh, some tips and tricks, and um, I think. Uh, uh, keep the questions coming. We have had a couple. Actually, one of the, I should just get to one of the questions around the reality of dealing with parents, um, as a as a positive resource, not as not as a negative. Um, uh, how do we how do we effectively engage with parents, bring them into the school, make them feel welcome uh, as and uh, integrated into the sports system that the school's operating? You might have an answer to that, Gregor. Yeah, well, I think one of the key opportunities is those um, year eight, nine enrollment interviews that often schools have. So, you know, those times where you go and get to meet a senior member of staff. So I would strongly recommend to any schools on this call that they make sure there's a question in that in those conversations about how have you been involved in your kids sport? before and what would you like to continue doing and that's an opportunity as well where parents are saying look I want to give back and an opportunity maybe to address some of those myths that you know we referred to earlier about the sport having this all the school having all this covered so I feel that that's a really really important time for schools to be able to engage with parents and to collect a database around people that have been involved in the past and I think as a sector we've got to get better at passing this information on from clubs to schools and 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 so forth i mean there's there's always privacy issues that um you know that we need to navigate and it's not always easy to share information about young people but there's absolutely nothing to stop a sports club with year eight kids saying hey you know these kids are going to your school we'd really love to keep in touch with these kids and support them in their sport um while they're there so i think those are really uh, big important opportunities and you know for school leaders um you know they need to speak to the value of sport and they need to be using the the, the um, channels that they've got, the school social media, the newsletters, the, the, um, the open day speeches to speak to that wider value of positive and inclusive sport and to, you know, speak to parents about the, the role that they can play in supporting that. Mm -hmm. Uh, things have shifted too, Roger, haven't they? I think it's not what it was 10 years ago where there was so much support inside a school ready to go. And um, I th NSOs, RSOs have done a, an amazing job recently of creating apps and, and other things where, you know, to coach a session isn't as scary as, as what it could have been in the past. There was that, that conception, I, I don't really know much about a sport, so there's no way I can go in and, and coach a team at, uh, at a secondary school level. Well, yeah, potentially, if you want to coach the first 15, you're going to need some um, sports specific knowledge to get those students to a certain space. But mostly students just want to play and they're just really thankful for the opportunity of somebody helping out in that space and having some simple tips and tricks that a lot of those apps have now makes that a lot easier. And so um, what I think what schools need to be better at and or and the sector in general around pushing that that message is that these these tools are, are really freely available. And if you just spend a little bit of time getting to know them, you can you can impact it inside a school far easier than, than you might think you could have. Yeah, and don't forget about the students in the school as well as potential coaches and managers and leaders. And, you know, this is a great win for schools, giving leadership opportunities to these young people. Um, and, you know, a, a code and a school being able to support these young people and give them training around, you know, how they can, um, you know, coordinate and, and lead teams. I think that's a really, really powerful, you know, it's not easy um, and it's often easier for adults to step in and, and do things. But also we've seen some amazing things in the schools I've worked in where, where young people have, you know, taken on those roles and flourished as a result. Another thing for the sports system to, re to remember is that year nine and 10 students are fantastic leaders mm. and often we forget about them. Um, they've come through a development leadership development system through the primary and intermediate years. Now they've been librarians or traffic monitors or whatever. Uh, and quite often we, uh, when they arrive at year nine, we forget about them as leaders, That's potential right. leaders, and we wait until they get to year 12 and 13. So um, one of the barriers to uh, a, a broader range of activity in schools is often that there's no one to make it happen. But um, if it's if it's as as you said, Mike, if it's not the first fifteen, then there's a lot of people queued up um, that uh, just need the support. Um, and uh, and coaching and leadership um, opportunities among younger students is 
I think, a, a big opportunity that's being missed. Mm. Um, we might just uh, whip through. Oh, yes, you, you might just talk to this briefly. I th we have covered this pretty much, haven't we, Mike? Yeah, I think in a, in a roundabout way, it's always just that thing that uh, we like to bring up when we're trying to talk about the value of school sport and how it how it's different in different places. And uh, for me, this speaks to the difference between um, the health and physical education curriculum and where sport exists inside a school. Um, it meets a lot of outcomes. And um, yeah, it's just that, that nice little space that shows that when it's done right, it achieves a whole pile of the purposes that schools are looking to do across the entire school. And also, you know, the, the well-being factor and, and what comes with it when it's delivered correctly, it just impacts and, and improves the, the whole society. I think that um, the school sport and sport out, the school outcomes at the bottom is uh, what you were talking about before, Gregor, and it's an important one. In the conversation that we have with schools that sport has with schools there is a value proposition here for for sport and physical activity and physically active young people to the school system these are the things that the schools are challenged with academic achievement attendance um you know behavioral issues those are the challenges of schools um in some ways our conversation that we have when we're talking about uh, uh what sport can bring and why schools should be supporting it is can be catched in the contribution that it makes to those outcomes Mm. And especially when you are focusing the offering that you're giving to the school around some of those kids that are on the edges of edges of the school, and 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 are disengaged, um, because if they're disengaged from sport, it's likely they're also disengaged from other things. So, so when you can shape up your offering to to really work with some kids that are less active and less engaged, then that's a really very very valuable, very strong value proposition. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, Mike. Let's just, oh, no, I just thought I'm we might jump to some, some of these, but uh, you carry on. No, 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 you go. You guys can talk to these. These are probably uh, some bullet points, some of these things we've covered. Um, the do your homework, obviously. There's, a, there's actually a lot of research and, uh, and information around school sport. School Sport New Zealand collates a, a census of, mm -hmm. uh, of what they call meaningful engagement in sport. So it's not the one offs, but it's. Uh, it's actually leagues and it's six week um, competitions and that that's collected every year but from pretty much every school so sports if they're interested in what their uh, uh, what the, sc uh, the school profile looks like for their sport can obtain that from um, school sport New Zealand and it also gives an idea of how many community coaches are involved in sports what's happening to teacher coaches whether students are coaching sports there's a raft of information but that's part of the homework um, as Gregor mentioned before, it's the, what are the values of the school? Uh, what's the strategic plan say? So there is a bit of work that people need to do, I think, before they approach it, but there's plenty of information available. Yeah, I think definitely doing your research on the school and what it's focusing on and what are the specific challenges in that area or more generally the young people in a, in a certain area is really, really important. And I think... You know, you can have conversations about that. You can talk to young people yourselves about that. You can also read the board minutes of schools. There are lots of ways of finding out what the priorities of a school are and, and tailoring your your offering to meet their, those needs. Mm. Uh, and it, it kind of relates, relates to that. To that um, yeah, you go. That's exactly what I was going to say, Rob. Same page. Yeah. You go, sir. No, no. Uh, off you go. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, your, your homework really tailors what that solutions-focused approach is about because it's, I, I think, where the challenge and, you know, dare I say, where the failing seems to happen sometimes is that uh, a, a sport will go into a school with with some fantastic sport outcomes and how that's really going to improve um, the sport and and how you'll see progression through that sport. But as we've said earlier, that's not the the um, the purpose and the outcome of the, a school's looking for. So your solution really needs to be focused around how that's going to meet the needs of the school. Um, you'll, you'll tailor that to make sure it meets your own as well. But um, I think if, if you see the principal start looking at their phone or, or starting to look at the door and looking around, you've probably lost them. And it's because you're not speaking their language enough. Mm. Yeah. Bring a friend as a tip. Yeah, well, I think that one, Roger, it's actually, um, James has actually put something in the chat that um, really relates to this this whole idea of bringing a friend. You know, maybe there's someone from another club 
um, that you can work with together and you can go to the school together. Maybe it's another code. Maybe there are, you know, you can do some multi code work and say, hey, look, we want to offer together over the next six weeks a range of opportunities for people. So that idea of, you know, schools are really busy places, principals and sports directors have got lots of appointments. Um, so coming together with a with a solution from a range of different people would be an amazing start. So that's what I was thinking of when you put up Bring a Friend, Roger. I'm not sure if that's what we meant, but that's what I reckon. Yeah. And I think that cross code um, opportunity is huge, isn't it? And it doesn't generally happen. Sports um, sports don't talk to each other and, and uh, go with a, a joint approach for a school. Yeah, I think that would be a really powerful thing to come, mm. you know, multi-code and say, hey, we want to give the young people of the school this range of opportunities. Yep. Um, understand there will be disruptions? Yeah, well, schools are such, such, uh, I don't know, they're, they're, they're constantly changing. Everything's different. And so it can be very um, frustrating for outsiders to come in and engage in a regular in a regular um, environment. So, you know, I'm thinking about things like timetables changing, you know, maybe because there's exams on, so the lunchtime shifts to a different time to allow three hours for NCA exams after lunch or something similar. You know, schools are notoriously bad at letting external providers know about these things. You know, there are school trips and events. Um, some schools have you know, wet weather lunchtime rules or it's a shorter lunch hour because of the wet weather or assemblies that run over or schools finish early for conferencing or year eight orientation days or, you know, the space you have for your activity might have a drama production. So you do have to be quite resilient, you know, working with secondary schools in particular and be aware that, you know, there are going to be times when you know, someone might forget to let you know about all those changes that are taking place. So, you know, there's a long game here and you've got to be pretty resilient and understand that, you know, that's just part of the experience. Mm. Yeah, absolutely true. And just a, a question from Grace um, that's probably pretty common is about funding and uh, the challenge of funding. And ab absolutely, it is a challenge. Um, what do you think, though, what school's offering? They, they have facilities. Um, they have people and young people and uh, uh, the, the cost of travel into school, um, national and, and, uh, and regional competitions, yep, that can get expensive and that, and that is the reality. Um, but not all sport um, has to be expensive, um, particularly sport that's played inside a school. Um, so you, utilising existing leadership and, and delivery agents. Um, so there are ways of thinking about um, how we can deliver sport um, that doesn't cost a lot. And um, it's interesting, all our surveys um, of young people say that cost's not a barrier to participating. Um, but when you ask parents whether cost is a barrier to participating, <laughs> then clearly it is. So, um, yep, it is a challenge. And uh, if, you've got, if you've got three or four kids and you want them to be physically active and they are passionate about lots of different things, then, yeah, the cost can get up there, can't it? Mm. And I think it is challenging from, from a sports perspective, because if, if you're going to a trust funder, then usually they're going to ask, uh, what does that program look like? How many times are you going to visit the school? And if, it's, if, if you're going in with a different approach to what they're laying out, it can be really difficult to get that funding. Um, you know, Tamanawa, as you very know very well, Roger has a different approach. It's a, it's a co-design approach and talking to the students about what that looks like before you get the funding. Now, that you can't do that with a lot of trusts, but um, Tumanawa is a, an amazing opportunity for uh, sports to work directly with students to come up with some outcomes that they want to see. And the funding is directly built into what they want to do and kind of not the other way around. Yeah, it's a good point, Mike. Well done. And uh, just uh, probably the last question that we've got time for, just around technology. Increasingly, uh, you know, the real cost, as I mentioned before, are, are travel and uniforms and uh, gear and equipment. Um, but technology increasingly is being used as a way of connecting uh, young people together and connecting schools together. Um, uh, technology like Zwift and um, uh, rowing competitions that are on um, on uh, rowing machines uh, don't need to be on the water or have a um, a skiff um, I think they will be increasingly popular because uh, 
one of the things that sport does for us is it connects people and it's the sense of belonging is one of the most powerful things about why people play sport and uh, we can start to look at technology solutions um, as they as they get cheaper um, and I think increasingly schools will look at those as options um, in a way of it'll it'll reduce the the uh, big costs and the time issues that um, people face in terms of trying to play sport at a time when young people are saying the, uh, the main reason they don't play sport is because they're too busy so as a response to that we need to find easier ways of um, providing them a sport and recreation opportunity in a school um, that that, uh, that doesn't get in the way of their lives. Mm, yeah. Right, gentlemen, uh, that's um, that's yeah, Mark, that's probably um, that's uh, been a really fascinating conversation, um, and uh, we probably have run out of time. I'm sure there are questions, but uh, that we might not have got to, but. Uh, but we're uh, we're very happy to uh, to re to respond to questions. If you want to get hold of Mike or um, Gregor um, or me or your regional sports director network, all the sport development uh, advisors in the regional sports trust, there's a wealth of advice and information that um, is available. And I would urge you to do that because uh, we can't solve all the problems of school sport in a one-hour webinar. No one's done it yet. Um, but hopefully, we've given you some some. Uh, a bit of gold and thank you uh, gentlemen for your insights and and background and, and experience it's been um it's been really um fascinating i hope uh, people got a lot out of this um finally i would encourage you to explore the balance is better website so some of the questions we've had around how to engage with parents how to understand what the real value of um, quality physical activity is um has been um through the the uh, the mill before and there's some expert advice on that website that um, would be useful for you to track down and, and uh, uh, so there is a balance is better newsletter that you should be um, signed up to if you're not then um, that's a, a really useful resource as well it'll, uh, it'll provide you everything you need to know about uh, youth sport and uh, and board of physical activity uh, and thank you to our tech guys behind the scenes as well they've done a fantastic job so I might Roger, uh, Roger oh, yeah? have, have we yeah. got time for the video the um oh yes we there, do that? there's I'll... a one minute video isn't there which might be um we might yeah, just get a squeeze in yeah it's probably a good idea actually Greg. so I, I did uh, miss that let me find it it is uh, a video of um the value of school sport which is why we all do this Sport is a real privilege to have in high school. I feel like at this age, boys love trying new things. You get a lot of confidence from playing a sport because you just kind of find your way and just like find the things that you love doing the best and I think football's that for me. Also enjoying the fact that it's not all about winning, sometimes you just want to go out and enjoy it. Winning's just a bonus. Just a chance to, you know, hang out with your mates, a chance to get fitter to see your health improve, your mental health as well. And it just makes me feel like alive and happy. It's just like another like family that I can go to. Like they're always just really supportive. Sport definitely gives a sense of belonging. It helps you form a bond with your team. It gives you people to hang out with, people to just share feelings with, I guess. The bonds that I have with my friends, they'll never be broken. Awesome. And thanks to uh, Mike and School Sport New Zealand for putting that together as well. So um it's a fantastic resource and we need to remind ourselves don't we every now and then of uh what young people see in sport but anyway once again thank you uh gentlemen um it's been a great session and uh and i uh, will close with our karakia uh tu mai ronga tu tawa mai raro tu tawa mai roto tu tawa mai waho kia tau ai te mari tu kia tau ai te mari ora tu tu whakamaua kia tina tina homi e hui e taiki e Nora era tenakoto 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 katoa kyoto